The opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Step outside of your comfort zone. See the world with a whole new perspective. Join us and experience the unexplained on the paranormal view. And welcome, everybody, right here to the Paranormal View on the Parix Radio Network. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to stop by and be with us tonight. Hope everybody has a great time, and hope everybody's had a great weekend so far. It's been really nice here. Been not real warm, so we've had a, a real nice day. I've been out running around. So, um, and those listening from around the world, we appreciate each and every one of you also. And if you are listening from somewhere other than here in the chat room and you want to come and join all these wonderful people, you can come to the paranormal. Ah, uh, that ain't right. You can come to para-x.com and click on the live chat button and you'll be in with all these wonderful people. And then you'll get to hear the paranormal view. How's that sound? That's even better. So um, with that, if you have questions tonight, uh, and you want to uh, send them over to us so you can private chat them to either Ceiling Cat. Uh, oh, you can even private chat them to this person, Marla Durs the Cauldron, or myself, Henry Foister, and we will get those questions out. And if you're listening somewhere else and have questions, you can send them to <coughs> the paranormal view at gmail.com. We will get those answered. So tonight we have with us, and I just want to let everybody know that last week we was live at the Bell Nursing Home, and we had some kind of sound issues a little bit. But we got that ironed out, and tonight everything should be sounding great. So we have with us tonight Barbara Duncan. I'm here. And we got Jeffrey Yule. Hello, hello. I haven't kicked off yet. And we have a special guest with us tonight who is actually going to help us with a lot of stuff because our show tonight is... Needs a, needs a lot of help? Oh, wait. <laughs> I need a lot of help. But tonight our show is going to be about Halloween. And our special guest tonight is... Jeff, why don't you introduce ah! I was sitting there like, no, it's not me. I'm just a co-host. Uh, well, tonight's guest is one of our all-time uh, top favorites, the lovely and talented Marla Brooks, paranormal investigator and author of 10 books, four on ghosts, two on magic, magic with a K, and uh, uh, CK, and four on cooking and television, and the novel uh, Bad Case of the Collie Wobbles. Marla hosts Stirring the Cauldron here on para-x.com on Thursday evenings, and while occasionally battling with witch hunter Canada geese while visiting Hollywood Forever Cemetery, Marla is always <laughs> welcome here at the Paranormal View, so welcome back, Marla Brooks. Yay! Well, hello, and thank you. All right. Well, we're glad you're here because tonight's show is dealing with Halloween. Well, and just Oh, but before we do that, oh, what? Marla also has uh, a line of oils and incense, I believe. Yes. Uh, yes, she does. And uh, I forget what the name of those are, but Marla would be able to tell us, I know. I don't <laughs> myself. <laughs> well, actually, 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 I kind of had to pull those. Um, oh, ah. Yeah, I mean, it was... That love potion, nine and three quarters get a little too randy. Uh, well, no. Uh, <laughs> let's just say that um, the distributor um, had some issues. Oh, there, there we go. That, that's that's a nice way to say it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I, I know all about that. So you just that's good right there. Did they, for, <laughs> did they forget? Did they forget? Strychnine is not a uh, preservative or uh, something. That probably wouldn't have been a bad thing. Um. <laughs> I, I think they was using too many bat wings, and uh, oh. I they put some toads in it. 
Yeah, it could be. A little a eye of... case of the eyes of Newt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The little <laughs> eye of Newt thing. But, um, yeah, I actually, though, okay, I can, I can plug this because it's not even going to happen quite yet. But I should, <laughs> that I am coming out probably next year with a kind of a starter kit of crystals and stones that have to do with the wheel of the year. So there's going to be like one stone for each Sabbath and a booklet that goes along with it about the stone and how to use it and stuff like that. It's coming out by Schiffer. So, and then in a really cute little box and everything. And I'm saying it's a starter kit because each Sabbath has a whole bunch of different stones that are associated with it. But just kind of picking, you know, the good ones. And um, it'll be like, you know, you'll get stones and a booklet and how to use them and all that good stuff at the same time. So I'm kind of excited about that. And each, and each stone will have an incantation as well. Mm-hmm. So, hmm. Along with your oracle deck. Kind of like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you probably can use the stones with the oracle deck. Everything's kind of, you know, branding in together there. But, but I just thought it was kind of interesting. You know, I've had, um, and you guys should have him on, um, Nicholas Pearson, who is like the gemstone expert and crystals and stones and he's been on my show a couple of times because he's written two or three books um and they're really good so that kind of got me a little bit more interested in crystals and stones more than you know i knew and he's the guy i had all right here i'm taking over the show but this is a good story that's your I, guess that's your job it's not. Uh, <laughs> but when my mom passed away with it with her stuff there was this big huge rock and I mean, it, it was like a two-handed rock to hold on to. And it was black and it was shiny. And I really thought it was a shiny lump of tar. Mm, I did. I, I thought maybe she went to the La Brea tar pits at some point in her life and, and, you know, had some tar. And I didn't know what to do with it, but I didn't want to throw it out. So I've had it for years. Didn't know, you know, whatever. But when Nicholas came on my show... And he started talking about different things. I said, well, I'm going to ask him. So I sent him over a picture of this huge rock, this piece of tar, this shiny piece of tar. And in about 30 seconds, he came back with, oh, my God, that's a huge piece of obsidian. Yeah. So it's a good thing I didn't throw it out. But anyway, that kind of got me, and listening to him um, on the show, got me kind of more interested in stones and stuff. And I thought... You know, people always want to go out and buy stones. You know, I want to have this, uh, you know, I need quartz. I need this. I need that. And sometimes you don't know what exactly you need it for, but it's pretty. And you buy it, right? I've done that. Peacock ore, for example, is gorgeous. So I, I keep that. But um, so this is, you know, it goes along. I mean, you don't have to be pagan to buy it or anything. But, um, you know, there'll be a stone for Samhain. There'll be a stone. I think it's black onyx. I've already thought that one out. Um, and a stone for each. And then the box will be such that you can add your stones to the little individual places where you have the Sabbath stones. So, yeah, I just, you know, something new, something different. And, um, you know, I just had to bid a fond farewell to the oils and incense for now. But nice. there's something else that's coming up, and it's kind of fun, I think. Hmm. That's really interesting because I now have a huge slab of obsidian as well <laughs> parked next to the front door see um because it's very good for protection mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's bashing, a good spot for bashing it. burglars over the head with it yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah that would work too. too yeah yeah i mean it's beautiful but i just i didn't think it was anything i mean you know it's like why would my mother have this huge hunk of obsidian but then i found out that I, I know where she got it now because she was good friends with the ex um, editor of the Tombstone Epitaph, the newspaper in Tombstone. And he was a miner. And there is tons and tons of obsidian in Arizona. So I think Wayne got that on one of his mining expeditions, and I think he gave it to her. And I think that's how it got there. Like from Bisbee? I guess, I, yeah. Because that's the only, uh, I, I, I'm i sure there's more than that in mind, but it's the only mine of which I'm actually aware, having taken a tour in there. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I don't know exactly, but I would think that's probably it. I mean, the guy, yes, he lived in Tombstone and, you know, edited the newspaper, but I'm sure as a miner, he got around and, and yeah. 
that was one of the biggest mines, yeah. Well, and plus it's really close to Tombstone. There, that too. And when I looked up, you know, Arizona and Obsidian, it said, you know, wow, you know, Arizona is well known for its Obsidian. So I, you know, but that was kind of neat being able to put it together because all these years I had this this lump of tar and I thought, Mom, where the heck did you get this? You know, and then two and two together, you know, when Nicholas told me it was obsidian and then I'm thinking, oh, Wayne was a miner. Yeah, there we go. So it's kind of like it, it solved itself, the mystery. Hmm. That was kind of cool. Well, and talking about the stuff that you get, because um, you and I have talked about this before, about ancestral altars. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if you are going to also have um, a, a book or a section on that. I could. <laughs> I could add that. I mean, definitely, because I have I have stones on my – I keep my ancestor altar on all year long um, just because I don't think I, – I, I mean, we're supposed to remember the ancestors on Samhain, on Halloween, but I think if some people only do that once a year, that's – not really great. So I keep mine up all the time. And um, I do have, I've got like amethyst and I've got quartz, raw amethyst and raw quartz on there. And, um, you know, there it, it's it's a good thing to have on an altar. It's a good thing to have on you, you know. And then I've got a little box in there full of all kinds of stones. And um, it was interesting because when... When my dad died, his mom sent me a big suitcase full of his stuff from, you know, World War II and all kinds of letters and even things that he had when he was a kid. And one of the things that was in this huge suitcase, it looks like somebody's old carpet bag. It's like a 1920 suitcase. It's really very interesting. But there was a box of marbles. And... Um, one of them is a cat sign. It's really beautiful. And... or it, looks not not like the cat's eye that you know we see in the regular marbles this is kind of neat so i actually have a couple of marbles on the thing too because they they really do match with the stone so nice. yeah but yeah keep the keep, people should always keep some kind of an altar going even if it's a tiny little thing if you're going to remember the ancestors and stones are very appropriate on there for whatever reason yeah so maybe I should add that to the book. Good thinking, Cece. Thank you. There you go. Yeah. Well, do you would you consider the Day of the Dead then to be an ancestral memorial day? It is. As opposed to Halloween, which is kind of a little bit different. Well, yeah. I mean, in in the Mexican culture, the Dia de los Muertos is something that you honor the dead with the sugar skull and, and all that stuff. So it's just another kind of um, remembrance if that's a good way of putting it. But yeah, I mean, we celebrate Halloween, we celebrate Samhain, but but there are a lot of people, I think, and you guys can answer this, I mean, do you, when you were younger growing up and stuff, did you ever think of Halloween as being something to do with your ancestors, or did you think about it being the boogeyman and ghosts? Oh, it's mostly boogeyman and ghosts. Uh, as, as a yeah. That's the way I was raised. <laughs> Only I, I was afraid of the ghost year round. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, karma got you, didn't it? Uh, <laughs> now you're chasing them. But um, yeah, so I think you know everybody has a different way of looking at things. Um, Samhain has always been more towards the the emotional side in a sense about you know the ancestors and those that have gone before and what they've done and you know revere them and have a dumb supper and set a place for them I mean there isn't really and maybe Dia de los Muertos kind of does the same thing I've never really been to a celebration and um, except for seeing you know the sugar skulls around and the coffins and little things like that I don't know if they have uh, something like we do you know, where we really kind of get into the ancestor thing. But I'm sure they, you know, do certain things like that. But in in this country, I mean, Halloween, can you think of any other holiday that, okay, Memorial Day remembers war heroes and, and war, servicemen? War heroes, yeah. yeah. But what is there, do we have another holiday particularly to um, think of our ancestors? I don't can't sure. think of. Yes, yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks, I, so. um, well, I don't think like that. Christmas. Mm. 
Mm. Kind of, but that's not universal. Yeah, I mean, all right, Thanksgiving is you give thanks for what you have, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're thanking your ancestors because some people may not. You may not be thanking, but you're at least thinking of them at those times when the Hopefully. family members are not there anymore. Hopefully. And yeah, when, I was, when I was at my friend's place for Thanksgiving some years ago, uh, they all traditionally take uh, a shot of whiskey or bourbon uh, to honor their, their late father. Mm-hmm. And that's a good tradition. And in, in my house, Thanksgiving was not about that. I mean, it was, you know, with the people that you were with then and, and the family. But I don't think anybody ever really talked about those who were missing, except in, you know, it's sad to say, but unless it was someone that passed away during the year. Well, you know, they, they didn't think about it. They didn't talk about it. We do a lot because of, boy, she could really fix Thanksgiving dinner or <laughs> yeah. stuff like that, you know. Oh, uh, that then it just goes automatically into you say my turkey's not good, and then it just escalates from there. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. He's right. Last day to fight. Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. It's all fun and games and some, until somebody brings out the fruitcake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're in trouble. Uh oh, I like fruitcake. Oh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Don't tell yeah. Patsy. Oh no, I haven't said a word. Didn't hear me say that. Mm-mm. Nope. <laughs> Tonight we're talking about Halloween and uh, and that one. Just what is the real history of Halloween? What did it derive from? How did it get started? And Jeff, you can jump in on this too, but you know, <laughs> it goes back about two thousand years. Um, it, it's it's a harvest festival, and the Celts believe that at Samhain time, which is like the third harvest. Um, that that was a time that, for some reason, that they believed that ghosts of the dead were able to mingle with the living. Um, it was the souls of those who had died during the year that traveled to the other world at that time. And so they started by lighting bonfires in their honor and, you know, it helped. Now, see, this is, it's a, I was reading where it said bonfires were lit in their honor to aid them on their journey. Now, what does that mean? Is that like lighting a fire, or giving somebody a hot foot to get them across? I mean, ah, I, I think it's it more like as, light, as though way. the light, as though moving towards the light wasn't <laughs> easy enough. You know, it's like uh-huh. it's dark before the light. You know. Well, that's true. I just got the hot foot picture in my head, and I thought that just makes sense. No. But <laughs> the bonfires were also lit in their honor, and um, and also they did the bonfires to keep them away from the living because you know on Samhain all manners of beings were thought to be out and about ghosts and fairies and demons and you know everything that went bump in the night um, so it you know it was a Celtic um, holiday tradition um, harvest thing and that's kind of where it started but then it kind of switched over to Halloween that most people know um, when the Christian Christian missionaries attempted to change religious practices of the Celtics. I mean, in the early centuries, way back in the first millennium, before the missionaries, like, you know, St. Patrick and, and stuff, um, they started converting pagans to Christianity. And um, usually not pleasantly. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, it was under duress, you know, but but it, it and the Druids, you know, who were the priests and the poets and Jeff, you know about this. Yeah. Um they they were the religious leaders, they were the ritual specialists, they were the, the bearers of the learning and um very much the same as the very missionaries and monks who were Christian to try and change the people around. So I'm sure that wasn't exactly a very fun time. No. But they wanted the the Christians wanted to make a holiday that was similar. That's kind of if you read up on it, most of the holidays that we share um, were similar because they would look at our holidays and make one close to it. You know, well, if you look um, so, at a ca- if you look at a Catholic mass, essentially you're looking at a pagan mass. Uh-huh. Every almost everything is mirrored because right. they were like, well, if we use their tools like knives and and cakes and ale and all sorts of stuff and we simply say we're we're referring to jesus not 
a different deity than people. And of course, my my favorite thing they used to do is conscript builders to build churches on pagan meeting grounds. So pe- pagans would show up to to do their circle and like, why is there a building here? <laughs> Yeah, we don't need no stinking building. Yeah. Exactly. And if you look at the architecture of some of the earliest churches, you'll see pentacles, Jewish mm-hmm. star, six-pointed stars, and all this little stuff. So, like, yeah, we'll put a little few. And I know they didn't have the term Easter eggs at the time, but pretty much right. that's what they are. Yeah. It's exactly so. what it is. I mean, so, you know, that's why it's so common they just if if you're going to convert somebody you have to convert them in a way that they're they recognize what they're being converted to yep. and that's kind of pretty much what they did but so that went on for the longest time but there were i mean there were lots of pagans who did not convert and and would practice you know uh to themselves and never let anybody know that they're doing it and that's this is kind of how we kept on going in that re- that respect but it's interesting that um, how Halloween got to America, you know, all these years later. Let's jump from way back then to about the 1800s. Um, the Irish get a pat on the back for doing that because there were nearly two million Irish immigrants that came over here, you know, with the potato famine. And they are the ones that are given credit for helping shape Halloween even um, into a, even a more widely celebrated event. Um you know, Scottish immigrants came too. They celebrated with fireworks and telling ghost stories and playing games and making mischief. And and that's where some of the games came from, bobbing for apples and and something that I've never heard of, dropping of forks on apples without using your hands or something. I mean, you know, all kinds of different things. So they came over with the immigrants and um, even the English, I mean, the observation of Guy Fawkes Day on November 5th kind of came to be intertwined with Halloween as well. Um, you know, anything that's got pranks and mischief is going to catch on. I mean, well, Guy Fawkes to... Day was more, cl- you, did, uh, you know, obviously that was a week later and it was yeah. almost more astrological sow in 15 degree in Scorpio. Right. Um, whereas the 31st, you know, they just sort of like grabbed that the way the. The church has decided, well, let's try and take uh, December 21st, the winter solstice, and make that into our Christmas, and we'll use the 25th because it has such historical significance, like, you know, battles and stuff like that. Well, and the church made, what, November 2nd, All Souls Day? Yep, yep. Yeah. November so 1st, that, yeah. 1st, um, yeah. Now, have you ever heard of a film called Lightning Bug? It's a little-known film, no. which I only saw because Laura Prepron was in it. Um, and it's a it's, – well, I – Loved her in the '70s show, and um, <laughs> she uh, she plays a, gr- a girlfriend of the the lead guy whose mother is like Carrie's mother type of proselytizing Christian type of woman, and he goes off to you know he wants to go out and celebrate Halloween. He's in his like very early 20s or late teens and she's at one point she literally says, "You know that's based on a pagan holiday, don't you?" And he goes, "Well, yeah, so is Christmas." <laughs> Wow. I don't think people know, you know, Easter too. I mean, you know, the yeah. the real big holidays, and because they're you know, around the same time, and they all again fall around the harvest season and and the planting and the reaping and the sowing and the, you know, whatever. Um, I don't think people realize that so much. Yeah, it's not really plus, taught in school. Well, Easter. Well, and we've kind of uh, hijacked holidays too, because although Halloween would have been a more of a harvest festival Mm -hmm. um in the united states at least now we changed that to a thanksgiving sort of Mm -hmm. holiday which is more harvest related right and halloween takes on a completely kind of different tone uh, at least in the united states i think maybe canada has thanksgiving too yeah yeah exactly but you know it's it's all in and you know um henry was saying the other day you know let's how did halloween get so commercial and everything but but the interesting thing okay here's the, here's the question for you all and you all get a brownie point if you get it when and where did the first halloween celebrations take place you talking about here in a yes yeah 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 well there wasn't there a, a lady in kansas who hated the fact that kids were pulling up and tearing up stuff, so she invented a Halloween parade. That could be, but that's yeah. not what I was looking at earlier. 
Okay. <laughs> there, but no, I mean, there's always somewhere. Um, but there is, I've never heard of this, but then I, I'm a West Coaster. There's a town called Anoka, Minnesota, which claims to be the Halloween capital of the world. And it was the first city in America to officially hold a Halloween celebration. And um, similar to what you just said, Cece, it was done in an effort to divert the kids from pulling pranks, like tipping out houses and letting the cows run loose down Main Street. And it said the town organized a parade and spent weeks prior to planning and making costumes and, you know, popcorn and and peanuts and candy and all that was going on. And the event grew over time and it was um, held every year since 1920. That was the first year it started. And there was only two years that they didn't have it, which was 1942 and 1943 when they were canceled because of World War II. But they still hold elaborate festivals with parades and carnivals, costumes and everything. And then it says um, also that Salem, Massachusetts, Um, associated with witches, you know, due in part to the history. Um, But they said they also laid claim claim to the title of Halloween capital of the world. And so, and and the the quote was that many historians quietly back away from that debate, leaving the two cities to duke it out for themselves. I like that. I I fell off. Which two cities? Salem Salem and Anoka, Minnesota. An- Anoka, Minnesota. I'll have to look that up. Yes, you do, because they, 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 since the 1920s, they claim to have um, been the the Halloween capital of the world. Yes, yes, yes. Ah. Well, I, that would be Scandinavian. Anoka, Minnesota, maybe. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, a, a now, I, I, I know that uh, uh, there's a new show called Haunted USA, and they did a. Uh, one of their little documentary episodes on uh, Salem, uh, mm-hmm. but we were mostly uh, on the ghosts and the hauntings around there, as well as uh, the occult stores. Um, they apparently there's they didn't mention Lori Cabot. Is she still with us? Yeah, yeah, she is. I don't know why they didn't deal with her at all, unless she just didn't want to be bothered with them. Or I don't know. Some people are afraid of her. Really? Hmm. Oh. Yeah, I don't know why. They should be more afraid of Lori Bruno. I don't know if who that is. Lori Bruno is, um, <laughs> yeah. she's in Salem. She's a Salem witch. She's a, an elderly woman, but boy, she got spunk. And I and I had her on my show. She's a Strega, um, Italian witch. And, yeah. you know, you got to be careful with them. And and so my, I was... My, my, met, my metaphysical teacher was a Strago, So. Mm-hmm. And so we, I had her on my show years ago, and we were talking about it, and I was not being tongue-in-cheek, but I was just curious, I, uh, lighthearted, because I didn't want people to get scared, because she was talking about how they take um, responsibility for whatever they do. They don't believe in the rule of three, you know, they're, they're willing to pay for, if they make a mistake, they're willing to pay for it. Oh. And I said to her, I said, well, how do you feel when people say that they're kind of afraid of stragas and she didn't miss a beat she just sat there and she said they should be don't <laughs> <laughs> it was great probably a good point yeah, yeah i mean she she's she's a pistol but she's she's really um in the sagan uh, sagan in the salem community she's very well known in there and maybe maybe laurie cabot just kind of took a back seat for a while i'm not sure yeah. Now, Kathy in the chat room wouldn't know if that was Salem, Massachusetts. Yeah. How uh, many other Salem's are there? There's Salem, Oregon. Well, you oh. was, uh, mm-hmm. she was talking also about Minnesota, and she didn't know if that, ah. that city oh. there oh. called Salem also. So. Could be. Yeah, Could that's be. true. It's got Springfields all over the place. Yeah, huh? So. So, yeah, we do. And, and Henry lives in Trenton, Ohio, and I'm from a state its capital is Trenton. Right, and it's not New Ohio. Jersey. It's New Jersey. Nobody Jersey. says New Jersey except Brooklynites and people who have speech impediment. <laughs> Although the witch uh, owning the shop in the uh, Haunted USA episode had such a Boston accent, it was so destructive. Do you remember her <laughs> name? I don't. Um, I, uh, I I can't pull it up because it would. Well, okay. maybe I'll yeah. try pulling it up during the break. So. Yeah, it'd be interesting because I know a couple that, that really do sound very, very much like that. And, you know, it's some, <laughs> if you're 
in the community and you hear it every day that you don't notice it but when you're not it's like whoa strong <laughs> accent but then yeah. people accuse west coasters of having accents too and i just don't see that i think you- anybody that has a uh, who can vocalize has an accent it just depends on you know from where you are true yeah um, so I-, I think what we'll do is go ahead and Excuse me. Mm, something's going to come back up. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, take a break, a quick one, kind of. And when we come back, we are going to be talking about uh, what was Halloween like when you were young. So uh, you can be thinking on that. That could have been so better phrased, but I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, Jeffrey's going to take us out, and uh, then uh, I will bring us back, I guess. Uh, Jeff, you should be able to hear it if you wanted to bring us back. But that's up to you. No, oh, yeah. Well, it doesn't, you know. I'll bring us back. You take us out. I'll bring us back. Okay. Well, you're listening to The Paranormal View on para-x.com with your hosts, Henry Foister, Seal and Cab, Barbara Duncan, and myself, Jeffrey Gould, with tonight's always wonderful guest, Marla Brooks. So stay tuned for more of The Paranormal View after the break. Whether you're listening at home, at work, or anywhere, thanks for making Para-X part of your day. Your source for everything paranormal, Para-X. <laughs> Who knows what lurks in the hearts of men? I thought you were just laughing because it's the first time I heard them saying uh, two hosts, one hour. The shadow knows... Welcome back, everybody, to the Paranormal View right here on the Parax Radio Network. That was a recording? Mysterious voices for some reason. And uh, tonight we have with us Barbara Duncan. I'm still here. <laughs> and we have Jeffrey Gould. I'm not on mute. I'm, I'm muted. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. I've heard you the whole time. <laughs> oh, you just didn't respond. I just. <laughs> and we have Marla Brooks with us. <laughs> and tonight we are talking about Halloween. And uh, before uh, we went to break, uh, we was talking about uh, what. Uh, what was Halloween like when, when you was a kid? What, what did you do for Halloween? Um, I know I'm probably a little bit older than, than most. Um, Halloween was a little bit different back then. I think kids could go out and uh, run around and get candy and stuff a lot more Hopefully. freely, you might say, without fear of and and I know that it doesn't happen all the time, but they have the big scare of razor blades and poison and this and that. Uh, back when I was young, we didn't get any of that. Um, nowadays, they set a time like, uh, oh, from six to seven or something like that, you can trigger treat and that's it, you know. Back when I was young, when it started to get a little bit dark, you hit the streets. And you wouldn't come back sometimes till nine o'clock at night. You'd have big old pillowcases stuffed with candy and stuff. So I, I never had any problems. And, and usually it was three or four kids out running at the same time together. Uh, very seldom was the parents with them. So as, as got up into the years, I know, um, uh, when I would go out with my son, I would be going out with them. They didn't run the streets like I did. So what was it like when you guys uh, went out? It was still pretty safe back when I was a kid. I mean, we didn't go overly far, um, but we we had – our mom was a costumer, so we always had rather nice, interesting costumes. And, um, yeah, we would – Go out and, you know, hit a few blocks and head on home, pretty much. 
Mm-hmm. Same here. Yeah, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Yeah. Go out, grab a lot of candy, come back, eat till you get sick. <laughs> and, uh, Barbara. Although I do have a great Halloween story, and that was when I moved to the East Bay here. Um, there, we had a nice, uh, entrance way and there were a couple of trick-or-treaters one of the little kids had this cat costume on and it was perfect it looked like a real cat <laughs> and my cats would run to the door every time somebody knocked to yell trick-or-treat and they looked up saw this huge cat and their eyes got really wide <laughs> it's like wow <laughs> Biggest kitty I've ever seen. They loved it. Super kitty. They weren't frightened. Yeah. Big super kitty. Like a, you know. Um, like Hermione when the Apollo juice potion didn't like work? A 38, <laughs> yeah, 38 <laughs> inch tall cat. Oh. Very cute. So, were you, how old were you when you moved out to the West Coast? Uh, 21. Well, where'd you live at before? Uh, Iowa. Iowa. So what did what was trick or treating like in Iowa? Oh, I told yep. you. You go out, get a lot of candy, come oh, home, eat till you get sick, and <laughs> that was it. Did all the kids dress up pretty much? Yeah. Yeah. Usually. We we did the uh, stuff. They'd put makeup on, you know, and. Uh, big red lips around your face or whatever and black eye and different things like that. Uh, pretty much uh, most of our costumes were like made with whatever mom could throw together, not go out and spend, I don't know, what what does costume run now? $25 or more? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you go to, to these stores to buy a costume for a kid, it's, it's not cheap anymore. Uh, so... And I suppose Marla just flew around on her broom. I used to have to find a costume that resembled humans. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that was it. Um, <laughs> but one year I did dress up as a cat. I, I did. And <clears throat> I had the ears and I had the tail and I had the whiskers. And didn't have any – well, the, no, the tail and the ears were furry. That was it. But I was like 20. And so it was, you know, you put on the leotard and the tights and the ballet shoes, and then you just, you know, throw on your ears and the tail. And that damn tail got. My mother made it, and it was about three feet long at least. And it was sewed on to the back of the leotard. And every time I turned around, I hit somebody with it. And when I tried to sit down, I'd stand up and it would bring the chair with it. It was, it was kind of a rigid tail, <laughs> it was kind of dangerous. Not unlike my cat now, his tail. Whip, 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 whip all the time. Yeah. Huh. Kitties. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 changed over the years. Uh, just, well, I think every holiday is pretty much changed now. You don't do a lot of the things, even for the the main, you know big holidays, Thanksgiving. Now has become more of a shopping day. Um, yeah. You know, Christmas is now more of a shopping day. <laughs> so, you, know, you don't celebrate the same way what? on any holiday now. What do you think that is? Greed. I mm. think it has a lot to do with it because you figure Thanksgiving, Christmas was supposed to be like family holidays when families got together mm-hmm. and they, they'd spend all day together. You don't see that anymore. Uh, my son and uh, come might come over, uh, him, wife, and the kids. They might be here, I don't know, three or four hours maybe, eat. And by the time it starts getting dark, they're gone to go home. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, when I was young, we would probably eat at my mom's, and everybody in the world would come there to eat. So there'd be people in and out all day. Uh, sometimes we'd eat there and then go to another family member's house, you know, and spend time there also. So, uh, they just don't do that anymore. I, I think, uh, number one is everybody's too busy 
And number two is what you were saying, greed. Oh, let's go get in line at the stores to buy stuff for when? Oh, Christmas. Yeah. So. It's sad. Now, Kathy in the chat put in a really good comment, and that is families don't live very close together anymore. Right. And, um, and Marla, this goes back to your ancestral um, uh, altar, which mm-hmm. is, w- wouldn't that also work for people who are not close? By? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, the altars are what you put into them. You know, I mean, it, this one's got a label. It's an ancestor altar. You're supposed to remember the ancestors. So I have pictures of ancestors back as far as great grandmother if that's as far as I can get but and then things that belong to them but an altar I mean in general can be anything you want it to be of of any any kind of celebration or remembrance or just you know things that are important to you or something it's just it's like your little like your little church you know (laughs) and um, you can put anything on there but I think I, I really do think it's important that we not forget the ancestors for, you know, a number of reasons, you know, basically, well, if they weren't there, we wouldn't be here. You know, that's a good one. Um, for us, for, for witches, for people that do the craft, I mean, things have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. That's something that, you know, we thank them for a lot, um, the old ways, the ancient ways. So, but you can, you know, People, I think I've heard of people that have um, altars up for family members who were in the service and who passed away, and or just even a military altar for everybody that they knew that was in the service, whether they're still here or not, you know, died in action or not. I think altars are really a, an important thing, and you don't have to stick them up and make this big shrine out of them. I mean, I've got a shelf of my bookcase. One of the shelves is my altar. Partly because the cat can't get to it there, um, but the other part is that it's just somewhere that it's out of the way, and people probably don't notice it when they walk in necessarily. Um, but see, that's the thing about it. People, a lot of people, and I'm not going against organized religion at all, but a lot of people think you have to go to church or a synagogue or, you know, a mosque to be able to celebrate your religion or to celebrate things around you. Um, pagans, we, we're like turtles. We, we carry our sacred space and our, our things on our backs in a sense. Um, you know, we can open a circle of protection. We don't have to go to a church or whatever. Um, and I think the spirituality of this whole thing is really, really important in our daily lives because a lot of people have lost that. You know, we're so busy with the here and now and what's going on in this world and whatever. We don't take the time to think back and and it's it's really comforting to know that you know you you look over at your altar and you see something that um you know belonged to your great grandmother or something for example it's just it, it gives you a spiritual feeling a spiritual feeling of family and i think that is kind of missing a lot these days that connection to the past yeah mm-hmm. well, that makes a good rock band the pagan turtles <laughs> 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 Uh, just a shell of but yeah I kind of, yeah kind of agree and um, especially with families that do carry on the tradition uh, through lineage because mm-hmm. um, there are a lot of families that do that um, you're also going to carry along that power to that thread yes um, through the altar I would believe mm-hmm. you do um, you know and See, this is the other thing. People say, oh, I can't do an altar. I don't know how to do an altar. I don't know what, you know. You do it, it, it kind of, you do what you feel. Put up there what you want, whatever is important to you. You want to pray on it, pray on it. If you don't, don't. You know, some people say that if you put um, a glass of water on the altar, that attracts the spirits. I mean, you, there's so many ways to do it, but there's no right or wrong way. But just, it, it's like, all right, you guys all, everybody that's listening, have you ever had one of those days that you're just kind of down and kicking the can and everything, and you go to your photo albums, 
and you start looking at family pictures and things when you were little and how that calms you down and how that centers you and it brings you back because you get that feeling, you know, all of a sudden you're five years old again, you're looking at pictures that of people that you knew back then. Um, same thing with an altar. It's, it's like, well, for me, I didn't have a lot of pictures because of, you know, losing my house and losing everything in it a long time ago. All my photos were gone except for a very few. And I've been able to, you know, talk to a couple of relatives here and there and, and fill in. But just having all those pictures there, just looking at them, looking at the grandparents, the great grandparents, the parents. Um, and also, you put your animals. You know, you put your little fur babies. I've got pictures of, of all of mine that have crossed over. Um, it's just something that calms you down, and it's kind of a wonderful feeling. And it doesn't take but, you know, a little while and a little bit of thought to do it. And if you're really into it, it'll kind of build itself. It'll tell you what should go on the altar, which is kind of neat. But it's just some place that you can go and get that warm, fuzzy feeling that we've lost pretty much these days. You know, it doesn't have to be super elaborate either no. because I have a lot of pagan friends that if you didn't realize, if you didn't recognize what an altar meant, mm -hmm. you could easily look at it and not even realize it's an altar. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's personal choice. And, mm -hmm. you know, it can be elaborate. It can be nothing. It can be, you know, people look at mine and, okay, so there's a few pentagrams there. They might get the hint. Uh -huh. But, um, <laughs> you know, and, of course, the, oh, the cauldron, which – survived last night because Tim Shaw got me a cute little cauldron, you know, one of those really heavy ones that they're heavy like a ball of lead kind of cauldrons, but tiny, you know, it goes mm -hmm. on the altar. And as I said earlier, I put the altar up to a place where T could not get to it. So I thought until last night. Because about 4 o'clock in the morning, I heard this god-awful crash. I couldn't even imagine what it was. I have hardwood floors in here. And this thing went bang. And I mean, I sat up and I'm looking around for broken glass or whatever. He's long gone because I'm sure it scared the heck out of him. But the, the, it's like on a high shelf. And he somehow managed to paw that thing right off the shelf. That cauldron came crashing down. And I think there's a divot in the floor now. But, um, you know, so if you have pets, try to keep things away from them. But not all pets are kind of, you know, like Conan the Destroyer like T is. But, um, yeah, yeah, it survived. That happens. Mm -hmm. Sure. So now when we talk about Halloween and ancestors, um, the, the practice wasn't ever to um, call up the ancestors in that manner on Halloween, correct? They were, back in the old days, people were running from them, and that's where costumes came from. You know, the original reason that people wore costumes on that night was because they thought, people thought that um, these were the nights where the devils and the whatever came out, and you didn't want to walk outside at night because you might be recognized by them. So people put on costumes if they had to go out at night on Halloween night, Samhain night. So the spirits and the boogeyman and all that would think that they were one of them and wouldn't recognize them and probably grab them off and take them, you know, into the bowels of hell or whatever. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that that's just, I, that was kind of something that I didn't really think about, but they, you know, people back then were deathly afraid of things that were on the other side because I, other than I guess their ancestors, they thought everything was bad. And scary, and it probably was because there were lots of tales like that, you know. Oh yeah, I guess. That's or or if you didn't treat your um, ancestor well, then they come they just come, back. <laughs> come back and yeah. So put on that clown nose to make sure they don't recognize you, right? Be in trouble, yeah. Yeah, exactly, and and that's why the bonfire tradition came too, because the fire was supposed to keep the bad spirits away as well. Um, you know, I would think and. Is that true with the jack-o'-lantern? Well, the jack-o'-lantern, yeah, it was a kind of protective thing. And, um, I mean, there are different versions of why jack-o'-lanterns came to be and how they came to be. And um, I think um, I think Henry has something that I stole from Steve Shockley today. Right. Um, all about the, the legend of the jack-o'-lantern. And it's kind of an interesting one. Yeah, we're going to play that in just a few minutes. Uh, yeah. 
actually when when the and I, I'm not sure I read it a while ago, but the the one thing the way it started out was they used to be made out of turnips. Right. And would put a burning piece of coal in a turnip mm-hmm. to so the I guess the spirits or whatever it was could light their way or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those turnips were scary. Oh yes. Uh huh. And uh, that's that's what it used to be a long time ago was turnips. Um, and then it comes over to the pumpkin and all that, and which we're going to find out about that in a minute. But what way back when what kids used to get for Halloween? And I don't mean back when we was young. Uh, it was even earlier than that when uh, they was actually going out trick-or-treating or having things they didn't actually get candy because they didn't make the kind of candy that we have today so what, what kind of things were they getting like for halloween soul cakes i mean trick-or-treating comes from from people going a souling and and it it's um citizens it it started in a bad way i mean poor people would beg for food and families would give them pastries called soul cakes. And in return for their promise, um, or they they got it in return for the promise to pray for the family's dead relatives. And interestingly enough, the, the distribution of soul cakes was encouraged by the church as a way to replace the ancient practice of leaving food or wine for the roaming spirits. So um, there's there's a really neat song I should have no I don't know if we could have played it, but called "Going a Souling" and it was it's really neat. But that tradition of begging for food, going to the door and knocking to the door, eventually turned around to kids who would visit the houses in their neighborhood um, and be given ale and food and you know a little bit of money here and there. So that's what they were after at that point early on. So are those soul cakes very um, similar to um, the ingestion of food for uh, around funerals, like sin eating? Mm, I don't know. Um, probably. I mean, you know, the people cook very much more simple than we do back then, anyway. Um, so I, I, I'm guessing they're just they were just kind of like little round hockey pucky kind of things. And, um, you know, it was, it was nutrition. I mean, for start, when you're starving, you know, a little hockey puck, a little piece of dough is going to fill you up, which is, you know, kind of nice. But, you know, it just, it, it went from the soul cakes to the kids who, you know, then got little money. And then I guess, because when I was a kid, you know, way back when, people were still giving kids pennies for trick or treat. You know, nobody ever gave nickels or dimes but you know lots of people would throw pennies in our bags hmm. we thought that was i was just interested the the soul cake part yeah uh was that the soul of a person that's the way it's or... spelled yeah but maybe it was Very maybe it had to do with the soul of you know maybe it, giving was from the soul too i'm not sure about that but that would be something interesting to look up um why they call them soul cakes in you know with s-o-u-l yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Good question. It's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I heard it said something else. You know, S O L. Is that the way you say? No. Oh, no, it's not it. Okay. All right. Uh, kids, um, I guess nowadays though they go to the store and everybody buys. Forty dollars worth of candy because the price of candy has gone skyrocket because of commercialism. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. It it is, and uh, it when when kids come, do you guys pass out candy and stuff, or what do you pass out? Mm-hmm. Candy. Do you? Yeah. Do you, do you get a lot of trick or treaters? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not as much. I mean, when we were kids, you know, you, as you said, it was like sardine cans trying to walk down the street. But oh, yeah. yeah. It, and it depends on the neighborhood. I mean, when I was in Hollywood, um, mm-hmm. uh, we didn't have so many because I think people were kind of afraid to go out at night and, and whatever. But now that I'm in the suburbs, we see quite a few out. 
But again, like you said, um, it's it's not the same. You know, they they go out just at the crack of the sun going down, and maybe you know seven seven thirty they're through. When we were out, like you said, you're out till nine ten o'clock. We were too. Yeah. We didn't go out until seven or eight. You know, we we went out at the time that kids are now coming back in. Right. Mm-hmm. And and the I guess the uh, neighborhoods had a lot to do with that. It does. Uh, yeah. It does. The first year that we lived here, I bet we didn't get two kids come by our house because the area wasn't completely built up yet. Um, it was older homes going to the west of us, um, new homes back behind us, but nothing going down the road the east from us. And so most of the kids, it was down to the west. That's where they were trick-or-treating at. They hardly would ever come on down to Archery because there wasn't but one or two new houses down through here. So we didn't get hardly anybody. And uh, then for a long time, they started building it up, and we would get a few here and there. Uh, I think last year and the year before, we had probably the most that we've had. So. I'm expecting probably a lot of kids come by this year. And I think the weather also plays a big part in it, whether it's rainy or uh, real cold. Uh, mm-hmm. So that, that really has a lot to do with it. <clears throat> well, I know some people that won't open the door because of they're afraid the gang members are going to come to the door. You know, or, you know, we used to be worried about getting egged or t- TP'd, you know, and now people worry about getting robbed and and hurt. And so a lot of people won't open the door in certain neighborhoods because they're just afraid of who might be on the other side and it's not going to be the ghost that they're afraid of. Say it's not going to be the ghost? (laughs) No, it's going to be a human being that you're afraid of. And, you know, for us to get to this point in this country, to be afraid to open the door on Halloween for kids because you're afraid that somebody's going to come in and beat the heck out of you or rob you or whatever, that's really some pretty sad commentary. But it, oh, yeah, well, it's the same as paranormal investigation. I'm more of afraid of the living. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. The yeah, head, absolutely. So. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a break. Um, Jeff's still having problems getting back on. He'll get on for maybe two seconds and then drops right back off. So we're going to go ahead and take a break, and hopefully that maybe he'll be back and then we'll play the uh, commercial, or not commercial, but the uh, thing that uh, Shockley has got for us about uh, the history of the pumpkin uh, when okay. we come back. Um, with that being said, and Jeff's not here, Mar- oh, not Marla, uh, Barbara gets to take us out. How's that sound? I can <laughs> do that. Oh. Folks, you're listening to The Paranormal View here on Para-X Radio. And our Halloween spooktacular with our very special guest, Marla Brooks. We will be right back after a few messages. That's Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern on the Para-X Radio Network. And welcome, everybody, right here to the Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to be with us tonight. And... Uh, I hope everybody's having a good time. Jeff, it still shows him coming on to uh, Skype, but it doesn't show him as being connected. So with that, uh, we will continue on. And um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, We have with us, I hope, uh, Barbara Duncan. Yep. And we have Marla Brooks. Are still here too. And we have thousands upon thousands listening from around the world. Is that right, Barbara? Uh, from around the world and into the afterlife. And <laughs> Germany, and the United States, Canada, England, and our little unknown friend. Well, that's, a, that's from around the world, I'd say. Yes, it is. That's pretty good. So, uh, as, as we were saying before um, we took a break, uh, we do have a thing we're going to 
be uh, played here, and it was uh, from Steve Shockley. He made and recorded it for us. So I'm going to go ahead and play that, and uh, maybe Jeff will get back uh, in time. So listen up to this. The story of the jack-o'-lantern. The origins of the Halloween jack-o'-lantern was based on the Irish legend of Jack, a mean farmer who drank too much. One Halloween night, Jack got so drunk that he felt his soul slide right out of his body. The devil immediately appeared to claim it. Upon seeing the devil standing there, Jack begged the devil to have one last drink with him. The devil agreed, but said that Jack would have to pay for the drinks. Jack only had six pennies in his pocket, but needed one more, so he suggested that the devil, who could take any shape, turn himself into another penny to pay for the drinks. And then after the drinks were bought, he could turn himself back and enjoy a final drink with Jack. The devil agreed, and faster than you can say Beelzebub, the greedy devil turned himself into a shiny coin. Jack snatched up the coin and put it in his wallet, which had a cross-shaped clasp trapping the devil inside. Jack then told the devil that if he would leave him alone for another year, he would release him, and the devil agreed. Jack at first tried to change his ways, but soon lapsed back into his bad habits. The next Halloween, Jack thought he was safe from the devil until he was returning home from the pub. The devil, as promised, appeared before him to collect his soul. Jack knew that he had to quickly devise another trick to save his soul, so he pointed to a nearby apple tree and asked the devil if he'd like one. The devil was once again happy to accept Jack's offer. Jack suggested to the devil that he climb up on his shoulders to pick one. The devil hopped up on Jack's back and up onto his shoulders, then made a leap to a nearby branch. The minute he hopped onto the branch to pick the juicy apple, Jack carved a cross into the tree. The devil screamed to be set free. He said if Jack would let him climb down from the tree, he wouldn't bother him for ten years. Jack said he would let him down only if the devil promised to never bother him again. The devil agreed. Before the next Halloween rolled around, Jack died. When he tried to enter the gates of heaven, he wasn't allowed because he hadn't lived a clean life. He had no other choice but to venture down to the gates of hell. But he was denied entrance there as well. The devil reminded Jack of his promise to never bother him again. Then threw Jack a lit piece of coal so he could see his way in the darkness. Jack placed the burning ember in a carved out turnip to use as a lantern to guide him on his eternal earthly trek. Over time, the lit turnip evolved into the candlelit pumpkins we now call jack o lanterns that help light our way on those dark and spooky Halloween nights. Right, now you know the history of the pumpkin, the jack o' lantern. So, uh, I guess everybody's back with me. I haven't lost everybody yet. Mm -mm. Well, having never made a pumpkin pie from scratch, wasn't it just a good way to get rid of the pumpkin exterior? Mm -hmm. Don't you use the insides to make the pumpkin, right? Yes. yes. I actually did that once, and it wasn't bad. Wasn't surprise, bad? surprise. Yeah, but a lot of work. Well, did you use all the seeds, too, or did you throw them away? I tried to roast them, but I didn't do a very good job, so they did get tossed. But, see, to me, all right, we all have childhood memories, childhood smells and everything. For me, it was... If you carve open a pumpkin, that aroma that comes out of there with the seeds and everything, I don't know why, but that just kind of makes me smile. It always did. And it's really kind of slimy to dig them out and stuff, but <laughs> I love the smell of a fresh pumpkin inside for some reason. Hmm. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. Do you eat pumpkin pie for uh, Halloween or do you do that more for Thanksgiving? That's more for Thanksgiving, maybe, but it is the pumpkin season because once all the stores start having pumpkin lattes and pumpkin muffins and pumpkin donuts, I mean, it's it's you can't get away from pumpkins now. So, Jeff, are you back? I am currently back. I am trying something sneaky. I actually was downtown the other day and was offered a free phone with free service, and I'm trying to put it on the on the other phone. 
So I'm trying to add you on Skype there and see if I get kicked off on my desktop Skype. Maybe you can call me in on my phone Skype. Oh, well, if you're on Skype, then I should be able to do that. You should. Let me see if I'm trying to add to chat. It's kind of weirdly different than... As... As he does. Yeah. Oh, no, no. <laughs> he's, <laughs> no. He's still on. Yeah, I can hear you. Now, speaking of uh, Halloween, Halloween back when we was all younger was a lot different than what it is today. Um, I think mostly back when we were young, it was mainly for the kids. Kids, younger kids would be going to uh, uh, parties and stuff like that. And uh, let's see here. What does that say? Would like to add you on Skype. Yeah, I'll yes. accept. Okay, all right. I'm accepted. You're accepted on Skype. So, yay. With that, now, uh, so nowadays, um, it has been commercialized so much that it's not just for the younger kids. Uh, there is more grown ups having parties than, and, and it's, it's costume parties, not just a drink and Halloween party, but everybody dresses up for it. So, uh, what, uh, do you guys, uh, go out to any of the Halloween parties? I haven't been in a long, long time. I don't get invited. Really? Here we are. Stick in the mud. Sticks in the mud. No, we're not sticks in the mud. We 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 have a local cemetery that has a Halloween party. Um, uh, and what they do is they have a little pumpkin patch for kids and then the kids go down the block where there's a lot of stores they do their trick-or-treating there and then they come back to the pumpkin patch and there's bouncy houses and and whatever Um, the cemetery is more like a park than it is a cemetery Um, and sometimes the cemetery also holds um, events like plays so they do Spoon River Anthology which is a um, a story of the dead yes. uh, telling about how they died yeah. it was kind of fun mm. wow not so much a party but <laughs> but kind of well not commercialized of course uh, nope. everybody wanted to stick their fingers into the pie Ew. Uh, so they sell billions of dollars worth of candy but it's not just candy anymore um they sell all kinds of decorations for Halloween. Uh, they'll be selling decorations also for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, but they do sell a lot of where people dresses or houses up and shining lights outside and just all sorts of different things. Some of the biggest uh, items that's, uh, I mean, they've been out for a while, but they're even really out this year that I've noticed is the uh, animatronics. Uh, and and you can get them in a lot of different places. Uh, I know Marla out there went to a place and she even posted stuff online. It was- <laughs> Spirit <laughs> store, yeah. Yeah. Well, believe it or not, next thing I know, they've got one down the road from us. Spirit okay. help. Matter of fact, they got two: one down the road and one north of us. Yeah. Uh, so we had to go there and look, and they have all these kinds of uh, the animatronics and everything. And they do also have a very hefty price on all these things, too. (laughs) They are, but you know what? They are, but they aren't. I mean, some of those real big ones, um, they're under $200. Now, that sounds like a lot, you know, and if you have $200 to burn and you can spend it on that, more power to you. But think about it. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, those things would have sold for maybe $2,000. You know, I mean, um, they're not so bad that you can't afford them but mm-hmm. still i mean yeah it's a lot of money but i don't know some of them are adorable but the thing is i looked at you know the ones that i looked at they were good they were kind of cute i i was really fond of the gargoyles and i didn't take any picture videos of those because i love the animated door knockers with the gargoyles on it and stuff i'm kind of a gargoyle person but there was there were some that were really good, and then some of them they didn't do anything except their heads moved back and forth, and the you know the 
voice recorder was in them and they were talking. It wasn't like they were going, you know, and scaring you. Um, the only thing that really scared me was a jumping spider. <clears throat> and I was going to take a picture of that. I, I don't know if I remember if I did that on Facebook or not. But long story short, Tim Shaw hates spiders of any kind. <laughs> hates them. Can't look at them. I sent him a, a picture of one without knowing that he didn't like spiders on um, Skype one day. We were talking and he cursed me out for a week. He was so, I mean, he literally jumped out of his chair just because I sent a picture. So, of course, I go to the spirit store and I see the spider. And I thought, oh, you know, there's a thing to step on. I didn't know what it did. I didn't really read the sign. So I turn on the thing and I'm going, hey, Tim, this is for you, right? And I've got the, my camera rolling and I step on that thing and that sucker jumped up. And I jumped back like something smacked me in the head. I mean, it scared the bejesus out of me. So, you know, because I didn't expect it. And then I looked at the sign. It said, jumping spider. And I went, oh, yeah. duh. Yeah. But, I mean, a lot of those just aren't scary. They're big and they make a lot of noise. But, um, you know, it, it they're not like things that would have really scared me as a kid even because they just didn't look good. There was one tree that was look, kind of like a the the Wizard big, of Oz kind of tree. Yeah, you know, it was talking. Yeah. And the throwing apple tree. Yeah. yeah. That was kind of cool. Um, but you know the big clowns and and um, they had this little girl on a swing that was so funny because she was good. You didn't see the, you know you didn't see her face and she's swinging and swinging and she's saying you know I something I love things that hate you or something. I mean it was really well done. It was a good poem. But um, I you know some of those things are cute, but some of them are just like silly. They're not worth the money, I think. And then they have a uh, Ouija board uh, tablecloth, yeah. which I have to go get. This there you go. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, we found some, and I believe it was at uh, the Spirit Halloween store. Uh, we found some like uh, shot glasses with the uh, Ouija board and all that stuff on them. And uh, Patsy got those and sent them to uh, uh, Tim. So mm -hmm. he got he got all that stuff. Um uh, we also found, uh, not just at uh, the Spirit Halloween store, but uh, Menards had a bunch of those uh, animatronics. And uh, we went into Home Depot, I don't know, a few days back, and got to looking around in there at their Halloween stuff. And they had some gigantic dinosaurs. Hmm. You'd push a button and they'd start moving and roaring and talking and, or, you know, just making noises. They had a, and it was a skeleton. It was just a skeleton of a dinosaur. And the other one was a skeleton of a, a horse it did the same thing. Uh, but they had tons of those different type scary am animatronics. Uh, it's I so amazing how things, they, they're taking the simplest thing and turning it into something that's very cute. And it doesn't, like Kat said in, in the chat room, the Dollar Tree has some cool stuff. You know, I mean, I've gotten a lot of decorations at the Dollar Store because they don't look cheap or anything. I mean, but I don't know. I guess they're seconds or whatever. But, I, I mean, I got this when I was at Spirit Store. Um, a friend of mine snuck away and got me this little gargoyle. But he's plastic. You know, he's like a squeezy gargoyle. And I thought, oh, this is really cute. And I squeezed him. But that little thing, its eyes lit up, light up, and it says all kinds of things at you. Wait a minute. Let me see. See if you can hear this. I'm just going to try it now. I am going to try it, yeah. <laughs> you are. Oh, that's cool. You yeah, are. And and it's a it's a squeezy thing, you know. It's not made of cheap plastic. I mean, or, or you know, something solid. You squeeze it like you know, you, you squeeze his belly, and now it comes <laughs> these sounds. <laughs> and it's so cute because it wasn't. I mean, it was cheap to get. Um, Spirit store, you know, had a lot of things like that that are kind of just neat. You know, this guy's sitting on the shelf with my other gargoyles, but he's the only one that can. His eyes light up red, and he can talk. I mean, I love little things like that. Very cute. We, <laughs> so he's like a gargoyle root. <laughs> <laughs> gargoyle. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, yeah. Have you got a Target uh, store out west? Sure. Uh, 
we was in there and uh they had tons of these things also we got a thing for uh the grandkids and i even posted it online and pushed a button and you could hear it say things but it's like a doorbell and you put it on your door you can't do it on the outside you do it on the inside but uh, you push the button and it opens up this one big eye starts looking around and it starts saying all kinds of things. I mean, weird. I mean, it's just being online and showing it to them. Uh, the youngest one was hollering, you know, Oh, I want that put on my door. So we took it out there the other day. And after they actually started playing it, <laughs> I don't think he was wanting to put it on his door anymore. <laughs> it's, if, you're, if you're in bed and all of a sudden you hear that thing go off at night, <laughs> <laughs> You're done for. <laughs> mhm. <laughs> Cuz it was scary too, boy. So uh, we thought that was pretty funny. Uh but yeah, you can buy all kinds of uh, different things like that. Um so it's very very good to set the atmosphere. And well, I mentioned the dollar store. I just remembered something. I've got this contest going <laughs> and I I was at the dollar store and I found this like skeleton he's wearing a Clint Eastwood hat kind of you know the the old-fashioned hat and a cape and and he's a skeleton and I brought him home and I stuck him on my door and on the outside of the door and then you know I, I said well, I've got to have some fun with this guy so I was taking pictures and posting him on Facebook him in different positions he went out in the backyard to where I have my um table with the plants on it and I've got little gnomes there and last year I got a little Transylvania gnome you know I've got this whole family of really cute gnomes and then there's one with this orange hat and he's a skeleton really cute so I take this guy out there and I pose him with them and then I go hang him on a tree I mean I'm just having fun with him but I realized that I didn't have a name for this and I, so I kept referring to him as my new doorman you know the guy that's keeping all the boogities out of here so I decided to have a contest and it's still time to enter it um the doorman needs a name. You know, I mean, he's getting kind of mad at me just calling him the doorman or the new doorman. You know, that's not very respectful. So if anybody's interested, um, you can go over to my website, which is www.marlabrooks.com, and click on the News and Events um, tab. And you'll see a picture of, or a couple, three pictures of, of the doorman. And it's a contest to name the doorman and it's going to be a random drawing I'll do it on Skype live sometime next week um, and um, the, the prize there actually is a prize some people might not think it's a prize but I think it's a prize yeah. um, I've got a box set of my Ghosts of Hollywood books um, one two and three and also a paperback of the bad case of the Collywobble so it's a four book deal if you want to win that um, just go like I said Go to my website, click on the News and Events tab, and um, everything is going to go into a big cauldron or a big pumpkin, whatever what, and we'll just do a random drawing, and whoever gets pulled, that's what the name is going to be for the doorman, and they will get the books. So they, name plug. doorman, huh? You have to go look at them because, you know, it has to be a name befitting of something of his uh, his door. caliber. But it's really funny because I every time I take a picture of him, it looks like he changes expression. It's so weird. It's just the way he's turning and the lighting and stuff. But some one picture, his eyes were just right there, and then you don't see his eyes are sunken. And then the next time, he looks like he's smiling. And then his clothes change color when he's out in the sun. I mean, it's you know. So I think he's taking a life on it of his own. Yeah, I think I think he's really out there working to keep the boogeyman away or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Keep him away, huh? <laughs> yeah. So he'll be rewarded with a name sometime by the end of the week. Yeah. Oh. Well, let's talk a little bit about the animatronics and the haunted houses that are coming up and um, how that impacts uh, Halloween. I mean, uh, I assume that the original intent of, well, and, well, the original aura around Halloween was people were scared to go out at night. Uh, because the ancestors were going to get them. So people are kind of taking that into a new tradition of these haunted houses. Um, some of them are full-on contact haunted yeah. houses. I, uh, uh, what's your opinion of those? I don't like <laughs> I, I mean, I, 
stuff scares me anyway, but somebody <laughs> reached me or whatever, I'd be cold cocking somebody or uh, picking the first stick up I had and, <laughs> and be swinging it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm afraid of those too. I don't like anything that can jump out at me. I mean, I don't like things that jump. Period. I've got a grasshopper on my plants back there, and I'm I walk around him because he's as big as my hand. I don't like jumpy things. And grasshoppers, if that's bad enough, somebody dressed in a scary thing that's standing there looking like he's dead and then jumps out. No. Mm -mm. Now, can yeah. you hear me at all? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, Marla, but last year around this time, I was part of a live immersive theater called The Tension Experience. Yes, I was reading that, yeah. And I, it, it, you probably really would have enjoyed that because mm. it was just really suspenseful and psychological horror and nothing really – Intru well, some intrusiveness, but it was all consensual. I mean, it, there were yeah. there were ways you were able to, you know, opt out if you, if people. And we did have people who were so freaked out that they would what we called coward out because safe word literally they had a safe word called mm -hmm. coward. Yeah. And one night during the climax, we'd have like our 13 people in our show, and I'd go to the climax scene, and I'm like, why does it look like there's only four people, only four <laughs> participants here? And our leading lady gets on the microphone to do her speech, and she's able to, you know, improv a little bit. But 99% of the time, it's all the, the her lines. But said, you know, five of you cowered it out. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> we really. And our writer director Darren Lynn Bozeman, who directed Saw two, three, and four, um, that just tickled him pink. He just loved when people were so freaked out by what was all the theatrics mm -hmm. was just too much for people to handle. Well, things in the mind are a lot scarier than things that you can see. Yeah. You get into somebody's head and you can freak them out really badly. So that, that would work that way. Mm -hmm. So probably the longevity of something like Halloween is the fact that people really do like to get scared deep down. I think yeah. so. In some ways, sure. Adrenaline. Hmm? Adrenaline. Adrenaline, yeah. 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 The endorphins and all that. That's true. The whole part of the unknown. Mm -hmm. well, plus, plus horror films are relatively safe. Yes, you allow yourself to be immersed in the 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 cinema, in the in the film and the story, but you know it's all actors, and you know there it's it's something that you can go home and you can only bring home what you think in your head. And that's why I never uh, watch them. Oh, they're so much yeah. fun. All right. Spe speaking of it's Halloween, a lot of people year round likes those slash and cut up and horror type movies. Mm -hmm. See how many they can kill in a night. Yep. Oh, uh, you could watch a season of Twenty Four. Oh yeah, wait. Well, oh, but to me, Halloween time, sitting around at night, watching black and white movies. Like Boris Karloff and Frankenstein, uh, the Mummy, um, the, the real one, Lugosi and and Dracula, uh, Lon Chaney, the Wolfman, Creeper from the Black Lagoon. Those kind of movies were to me Halloween movies. Mm -hmm. This yes. other stuff, Freddy Krueger, how many can I slice up? And, you know, I'll come back next year as Freddy Two, and and you know, and it just to me those those are just not to me they're not good movies. They they may be good movies, but not to me. I, I just never cared for those kind. So, but that's me. I don't like anything that scares me. How about how about horror films that are funny, like? Yeah. American Werewolf in London, Trick or yeah, Treat. Yeah. Dracula, Dead and Loving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Twice Bitten. Twice like, Bitten. I like yeah, Twitch was, anyway. Oh, now, oh. Pat, Patsy's watched all those, and uh, she liked all them. Uh, I just never cared for them. Has she seen uh, – you I should find out. If she, I, 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 I'm lucky I'm still on Skype. But um, has she ever seen the movie Trick or Treat? That I have no idea. That she, is the epitome of Halloween movies now. 
that Sam, little Sam in that film, is now literally the the iconic Halloween mascot for films. Have you seen that, Marla? Mm-mm. No. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I don't know if it's on Netflix because Netflix is getting really weird, and it's like, yeah. oh, why should we show movies when we have original content? I'm like, because you're supposed to have movies. <laughs> um, but Trick or Treat, um, I'll, I'll send you the link to it. Okay. It's it's ah it's just it's it's dumb it's an anthology film similar in both style and humor of creep show the film back in the eighties with Stephen mm-hmm. King stuff mm-hmm. that kind of and it's all happens in one night but they're overlapping stories so stuff is happening within you know the same time frames so if you notice at the transition you'll suddenly see like an overlap of time and you'll see characters from a different vignette in in other stuff so it over overlaps pretty well mm, okay and it's got That's anna pack anna paquin and a lot of other uh name actors you recognize um uh brian cox is in it and when when they asked him to do it he says as long as you can make me up to look like john carpenter and they <laughs> did oh so, well yeah that's cool so marla yes. do you think uh the veil as it's called mm-hmm. Um, that ghosts are, are a lot more prevalent during the Halloween season, or is it just that uh, we tend to look for the boar, or is the veil thin enough where they uh, are seen more? Well, um, I don't know where the thing came about the veil being thinner, but I think it, it it's not something physical. I mean, it, it's... I think... The veil is the way it is all year round. But as you know, when you get into ghosty stuff, um, you open doors, you open portals, you open yourself to it more. And I think more people now are actually more aware of it too. So I don't think that the veil is necessarily thinner this time of year. But I think because we're attuned to it, we're looking for it, um, I, I think that's where it comes from that anybody can come through because you know they're in the old days they were worried about fairies and gnomes and trolls and and whatever coming through um you know they could do the same right now as far as i believe you know i don't think there's any doorkeeper that's saying okay well no you better wait till halloween you better wait till sam Samhain because <laughs> you know you just uh-uh. no i think it's always like that but we're just i think we're more aware this time of year and when you're aware, your senses senses get heightened, and even people who don't think that they have any abilities at all, or you know, can't see anything like that, um, they might, because they're just more sensitive to it mentally. They might, huh? Hmm? Do you think that it's um, sort of a which came first, the uh, the ghost or the ghost hunting shows? Um, that we're we've always had the same amount of hauntings, but just more aware uh, since like ghost hunting shows came yeah, out. Yeah, of course, the media just you know people people live on TV, you know, and they live. I think I don't remember when they started coming out. Was it around Halloween and then it just cut on or something? I don't know. Um, I don't remember because the first one that I saw was Most Haunted, you know, the British one. Um, and that was before we had any of our own. And, and of course, the Brits have always been into it more than we have anyway. But um, certainly, you know, when something's on TV, people jump at it. Because, how? I mean, you know, write a book and I'm, – I'm just using odd numbers. Write a book and a thousand people will read it. Put it on TV and a million people will see it. Uh-huh. And that's probably why it got so popular. Yeah. Uh, back before any, back before I started doing anything, if I walked by a place and it even looked like it might be haunted, I was on the other side of the street. <laughs> uh, you couldn't, you couldn't drag me into a place. Uh, anybody talk about say, oh, that place is haunted or got something in it? You couldn't make me go in there. Uh, so wow. I'll go in, but. Uh, Either cat or somebody else is going first. (laughs) (laughs) I think I like using cat clicker as a human shield. (laughs) Shame on you, Henry. Shame. (laughs) 
<laughs> now, oh, by the way, Marla, you know, I'm, I'm starring in a movie next year, which is going to be filming Anne Mansfield at the Reformatory. Oh, nice. So I'm, going to, I'm going to be able to finally uh, investigate there. Oh, perfect. That's great. Have they got a date set for that yet? They do not. Okay. Let me know when, and I'll see about when I'd be able to drive up there. And Absolutely, see. yeah. I'll be telling, like, everybody, you know, <laughs> have to set aside a, a night or something to... Okay, I got a I got a question here from the chat room from Tabby. Uh, she said, "Ask Marla, what is the significance of lighting a candle or light on All Hallows Eve?" Uh, there, I've read a couple of different reasons why you do that. Um, one of them was having to do with like what I mentioned about the bonfire before that you light a light and it'll keep them away. Um, other people have said you light it because it'll bring them in, you know, um, <clears throat> because you want, they, they were doing it to do it for their ancestors, the ones that they wanted to come in, you know, so here I am, you know, it's maybe they forgot the address. <clears throat> so, um, I think it, I don't know, it went both ways in, in the stuff that I was reading. I was reading about it today, as a matter of fact. So one was to keep them away and one was to let them in while you would lit the light. And I'm sure there's about six other better reasons than that that I just haven't found yet. Well, candles would have also been used for scrying at that one point, right? Yeah, um, true. With the candle wax. I, mm -hmm. uh, I know that uh, you're supposed to peel an apple all in one uh, strip, mm -hmm. one move, mm -hmm. yeah, and then throw it over your shoulder and the letter was supposed to be uh, who you were going to be. Either that or see whether or not you hit the cat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine would throw it back or try to strangle me with it. <laughs> that, but that was the other thing, divination. Very many divination methods were done back then with, like you said, with the apple thing. Um, bobbing for apples was some kind of weird thing. Um, but there were different ways, you know, you would take something, I, I don't remember what it was, but you put it under your pillow on Halloween night, and you would dream of who you were going to marry kind of thing. It was very much um, concentric to your love life and your future, and, you know, you're going to live happily ever after, and who is going to come into your life? You know, what's his initial? Ooh, you know. So was divination tied to... Uh, Halloween strictly for the reason that they thought divination was contacting the dead for answers? I think so. I, I think um, there were, all, I, I, there's always been like soothsayers and fortune tellers. I mean, you go back into history, you know, probably to the cavemen and somebody was doing hieroglyphics on the wall, which was divination. <clears throat> so there's always been that. And with this time of year and people thinking about the dead and everything, um, I think it kind of went hand in hand in a sense but back then I mean the divination was probably much more simple than what we have now I mean of course it is but I like the old ways like I like automatic writing for one I mean that's been around for a thousand years or scrying in a mirror or, or scrying in, in a glass and looking at the water in the glass I'm not very good at scrying but um, there's so many different forms um, I think people wanted to try and get a hold of their relatives you know how are you just like you know that go to a medium now to find out um well that... my my teacher my my divination uh well my metaphysics teacher Vinny, uh used to define necromancy as annoying the dead to ask them really stupid questions <laughs> well yeah that could be that could be very true so what is a was it a dark mirror or black mirror? A scrying yeah. mirror, yeah. That's used for scrying. And mm -hmm. uh, are you supposed to see stuff in that when you ask questions? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and sometimes you don't ask questions. I mean, even a crystal ball, you're not necessarily going to ask a question. You're just going to look and see what visions come to you. And like I said, I'm not good at it. Tim Shaw made me a scrying mirror, a little black mirror, a long time ago. And try as I may, it's just like you trying to get an EVP. Ain't happening, <laughs> you know. I just I can't get an EVP and I can't uh, see anything well, in the scrying yet. mirror. 
yeah. you haven't yet. It's not that you can't. It's that you haven't yet. Well, that's, that's why people would drive me crazy saying there's no such thing as ghosts. I'm like, no, what you're saying is you haven't had a paranormal experience yet. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Jeff. Um, I keep hoping. But, you know, after a while, it's like, well, okay, well, if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, that's the way it's going to go. I don't but, know how many uh, hours of raw footage I've uh, gone through before I finally got my EVP on the Queen Mary. Mm. Well, that's good. Well, that nice big piece of uh, polished obsidian yes. also acts as a very nice grind. Yes, it does. Yeah, because it is bright and shiny and big enough that, you know, yeah, I I should do that. I should it- try to- is it spherical or jagged or? It's it's raw. I mean, it's not polished at all. It, it's oh. it looks like so if you just took some tar that was just ready to mold and you could kind of squeeze it and move it around. It's got it's got sharp things on it. It's got no rounded corners. I mean, it, it's so it's, it's sort of like an obsidian version of quartz that's just opaque. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. It's nice. But, I, I mean, polished stones are really nice, but there's a beauty to the raw stones, too, sometimes. So do you have to use a saying to make it work, or are you just thinking you yeah. look at Incant- it? Incantation, do you mean? Yeah. Why well, for scrying, I don't think I would do that. I would just, it's more like a meditation than an incantation. You have to just kind of meditate on it and and concentrate on it. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't do this hocus pocus dominocus, hey, whoever's in there, you know, the Rocky and Bullwinkle thing. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I wouldn't have them, you know, because you never know what's going to come up. From the wall, you know, no, I wouldn't do anything like that. No. And, and basically, people think that you're going to see something like in The Wizard of Oz, you know, you see when you look in her, her crystal ball, she sees Dorothy in the poppy patch or whatever. Um, when you're scrying like this, a lot of times it's more symbolism that you see. You know, like reading tea leaves, you know, when you empty the cup and you dump the thing, you look to see what the tea leaves look like. It's not that they're animated, they're going to, you know, turn into Gumby or something and wave at you. So I think that's the same thing with scrying. Maybe some people do see things, but I I think I, I was taught that it was more symbolism than, than actually seeing something. Plus the seeing is more... Well, in speaking, yeah, I was going to say... Hocus oh. pocus here. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say mostly it's uh, for focus. A mm-hmm. lot, almost all pagan and Wiccan tools are to focus the mind, mm-hmm. as opposed to being physical things that have like powers themselves. Exactly, that's what a wand is. It's a focal point, basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And speaking of hocus pocus, uh, the big question is: Is does magic done on Halloween yes. more effective or stronger? It's different kinds of magic. Um, so I, I think all magic works best by intention. So I don't think that it's necessarily Halloween that makes the magic better. I think it's the person's frame of mind and their desire to make things happen. But that it's the same as any time of year. It's just, a so, you know, magic is associated with Halloween. So people are thinking, yeah, this is how it works. But lots of the magic that is performed um, – they do a lot of protection spells because people are afraid. But you also do spells to communicate with the other side. You're, you're sending out blessings. You do all kinds of different – I mean, every every Sabbath has certain spells attached to it. And I, that that just gave me an idea. I might not – I might put that in my stones thing too. Mm, good thinking. Um, <laughs> that's two I owe you, Cece. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think – I don't think it's any stronger – but I think people are more into it at that point, which makes it work better. No. Do you think that the help of an ancestor on the other side or the ghost on the other side, uh, if you uh, talk to them about whatever spell you're doing, might enhance? I think it could. Uh, a yeah, spell? I think it could. Although generally think, you're you're if, evoking the the deities as well, though, which is yeah, both. Now. Well, I, I don't know. I don't always evoke deities for spell work necessarily. It depends on what it is. But if I'm doing a simple spell like on my my um, tarot deck, I mean my op- eh. oracle deck. Oracle deck. Thank you. Um, I just um, the incantations aren't. We're not calling on anybody. It's just an incantation to enhance the card. 
So um, there's no particular deities mentioned. But a lot of people, of course, do. It, it just depends. Now, I know way back in the early 20s and 30s that uh, in Kentucky, you would have traveling salesmen go around. And because they didn't have a lot of hotels and they'd be out traveling old back roads, when night come, they'd stop at houses to see if they could put them up for the night. And a lot of these guys did things that uh, you could say, like raising the table, making it knock, mm -hmm. whatever, and, and things like that. Now, they used some kind of a saying or something to do it. Now, my grandma said that one come through, and, and she was like 15 years old, and there was a bunch of them there, you know, in the house, and the guy was going to make the table talk, and he took my grandma and set her up on the table. And he <laughs> said, uh, table, I want you to rise and knock one time forever year old she is. And it rose up, knocked 15 times, and her sitting on the table. Mm. And he said, table, I want you to rise and knock one time for every year it is until this girl gets married. And it rose up, knocked one time. And... uh by the time she was 16, she was married. She used to tell us that all the time. Now, how do they get something like that to work? They Is it a spell and incantation that they do? or No. Because I, I also used to tell me let's that... Put it this way, let's put it this way. The guy could have, should have gone on pen and tell fool us. Well, well, see, I don't necessarily... I mean, that stuff works... Uh, you have to believe in it. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that uh, other people don't believe in that we believe in. So, such as ghosts. Uh, but these these guys would do this much in different places that people couldn't stay in houses sometimes because the walls would start knocking. That's better than the walls bleeding, I guess. So, well, yeah. I'm, I'm just... You know, that's all these old tales that they had down there. But what my grandma told me uh, was true. Uh, that happened to her. Uh, I've seen Tim doing the table tipping. And believe you me, I was looking every which way to make sure nobody was making it jump up and down or hands under it or anything. And they wasn't. They had to get up out of their chairs, and that table was moving around the floor. And yeah, I saw the video. That was kind of cool. I do have the video of it, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So that, that did happen. And that was right over here, the first uh, investigation I was ever on with all them people. So you better believe I was looking at that just because of the tales that I'd heard my grandma and them tell me from being down there. That's why I won't go down there to any place and then back up in hollers to old places in Kentucky. <laughs> Couldn't That's the place I would go the first place. Yeah. <laughs> it might be, but not me. Uh -uh. No. I mean, I was, I, that's like when I was um, investigating a Masonic lodge in Pasadena uh, with some friends, we had just left one room and got into the main auditorium. And while we were all standing there, we were the only people in the building. There was this loud noise in the room we had just left. And about most of us, I certainly turned towards it. And the the leader of the, the leader of the group almost, you know, lost it in his pants going, did you hear that? You know, and he, he already saw me turning saying, you, you heard that, right? I'm like, yeah. And I just headed right for it. He just could not understand why I was going in the direction of the noise as opposed to like elsewhere. <laughs> well, you have to go check that stuff out. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, one final thing. What one movie says Halloween? Trick or Treat. Uh, House on Haunted Hill. Mm. Which version? The Vince Price? The original one, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I have, to, I have to put my vote in for Hocus Pocus. Well, that. <laughs> Hocus Pocus, good Halloween movie. Yep. Uh, our time is, you know, like running right on by. Uh, we got about five minutes. Um, 
Is there anything you guys uh, want to shout out about here for the last uh, minute or two? Uh, what do you think of Jody Whitaker, um, Marla? Um, what should I be thinking? I don't, I, I think I'm uh, out of the loop. She's the next doctor. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, all right. I'm um, more into classic things, and I'm not going to say she's going to be a bad doctor. I mean, I didn't, you know, I wasn't too sure about the last one. He was an old man, right? But um, so are the know. classic ones. I know, but I just think that that right now, and I'll change uh-huh. my opinion, I'm sure. But right now, I would prefer Doctor Who to be a man. As would I. I was I was concerned with a female only because I was worried about the concept of a uh, P- Dr. Pulaski from the second season of The Next Generation, mm-hmm. where she was cantankerous and it didn't work the way they wanted or the way any right. of the fans wanted. But uh, Jodie Whittaker was in Broadchurch, and yeah. she is yeah. a She's fantastic good. actress. So yeah, she is. yeah. So I'm give I'm giving her way huge better than down. I I'm and- pretty sure she'll do good. And the companion will be a guy, so it'll still be, yep. you know, mix and match. So, yeah, no, I just, I'm a, I'm just more into classical things, you know. No, what? You're not? Uh-oh. But, yeah, I'll, I'll change my mind, I'm sure. Well, I, I will admit, when they did the reveal and they showed her eye and I realized female, I literally screamed no. And because <laughs> she was short-haired blonde, I didn't recognize her as Jodie Whittaker because I was uh-huh, used for yeah. long, dark hair. Right. And then when I looked her up, I'm like, oh, okay, well good all right i know she can act because i've seen Broadchurch and she's wonderful so yeah mm-hmm. she'll she'll and of course it's also up to the scripts right right uh, let's hope chris Cherbnall knows what he's doing yeah. he's written some good episodes i've liked some other commenters haven't liked them and i'm like why well we're uh, gonna have just, to get used to it because it's all new writing staff you know i mean yep new doctor new writing staff and and uh should be uh, interesting hope- Oh, he means we'll eventually get another season of Sherlock, too. Oh, that'd be great. That would be good. Well, Marl, I want to thank you for coming on on such short notice to talk with us tonight. Well, you're very, very welcome, and thank you for asking me. Of course, I always do, and usually you say no, so. Well, what? usually I may be doing stuff here and there. A couple of weeks ago, I wasn't going to be home when you asked, but, you uh, know. Joking with you. <laughs> so there. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah, no, no I, you're I all like, great, and we always love having you come on. And I do when I can, so that's a yeah. good thing. You know, next time you're local, like hitting for, for Hollywood Forever or, or anything like that, let me know. I, You know what? It's so hard for me to get out there. I think I've only been there twice in, in recent months. Um, well, you know, Dearly yeah. Departed's doing a whole bunch of stuff for the holidays. I know. Right? He's got a Houdini seance on the 31st up there. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, why don't you give us out all your stuff where people can get a hold of you, find you, follow you, and listen to your show? Uh, really quickly and so simply, its website is marlabrooks.com and ParaX um, on Thursday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern, and I'm on Facebook. Easy to find. And Just- Twitter. And Twitter, yes. I Oh, God, I bit the butt on that one. I did. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And and if you Google, just Google me, you'll find me. I'm I'm easy to find. All right, hang out for a couple of minutes. We'll talk with you when we get off. Um, next week, a uh, couple of weeks back, we did a show and we couldn't actually get on, uh, but we did the show. So next week, we are going to play that podcast for our regular show. It is with Cody Knotts, who is the director of the movie Kexburg. So, a uh, very interesting uh, show that was. Uh, so, tune in and listen to that. Uh, the only reason we're playing a pre taped one is normally I don't take off unless it is because of some sort of mechanical problems. And this time, though, I am going to a Halloween party. And we had a taped show that hadn't been aired yet so we are going to play that next week at the same time so uh jeff won't you give our stuff out real quick uh the paranormal view.com is our official site go to facebook.com slash the paranormal view there we are uh we're on twitter at paraview radio and uh my i'm on twitter 
at uh, Real Badger, R E A L B A D G E R. I'm also findable on Facebook. So um, there you go. So with that, I want to thank everybody for listening tonight. I uh, hope everybody had a great time. And uh, Barbara, you got anything real quick? All right. So good night, everybody. See you next weekend. You've been listening to The Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. Join us again next week at the same time for more of The Paranormal View.